I had a really good friend of mine. I went to lunch and he said, I don't know who this guy is here in front of me. And he goes, let me ask you a question, honestly. Right now, what are you grateful for? And at the lunch, I said, nothing, brother. There's nothing good in my life right now. As I'm mouthing these words, two people walked in with an older man. Both of them clearly were fighting cancer somehow. Both had lost their hair. One of the ladies had a bonnet on and they were barely moving in. Both walked by our table and gave me the most warm greeting, the warmest smile as a stranger. And he goes, that's pretty freaking pathetic. You can't find anything in your life to be grateful for right now. There's this thing people think that like, I'll be happy when. Once I get like this big amazing home or once I get this car or once I get this relationship or an amount of money, then I'll allow myself some happiness. The problem is the, the finish line always moves. You never arrive there, right? The other part is people think, well, if I enjoy myself now, I'm gonna lose my drive. In other words, if I can just wire myself with enough pain all the time, I won't lose my drive or ambition. The truth is there's no correlation between the two at all. There's no relationship between you feeling complete pain all the time and losing drive. And so I talk about living in a state of blissful dissatisfaction. And really the best example of that would be like if you've ever, I love a good meal, right? You know, if I bite into a great piece of steak, if you're a steak eater like I am, you take that first bite, it's like complete bliss, right? There's no correlation between how great that tasted and your lack of desire for the next bite. In fact, that bliss causes you to want more of it. And so the more we can begin to reward ourselves with bliss, we're not gonna lose our dissatisfaction. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna lose that. And so for me, our brains, this dopamine hit you get when you do something successful, if you constantly cheat yourself out of that hit, right, biomechanically in your body, less and less in the future will you want to achieve the next level, the next dream, the next step. And that's why so many people stall out in life. We build habits, rituals, and disciplines that serve us, okay? The reason my standards are set so high is because I don't want to leave it up to my own devices. My standard is one more minute on the treadmill. My standard is one more person I can reach that day, one more phone call, one more something. And so for me, I raise them every single year, but the way I get to do it is I link it to my reasons. And so goals are really empty to me. You show me someone with compelling, emotional, gigantic reasons, I'll show you someone who's changing their standards all day long. So like, give you one quick version that you've not heard before. One of the reasons I'm relatively fit is not just peak state. I have an uncle in my family that died at 50 years old of a heart attack. He's my godfather, my dad's only brother. I kind of resembled him. And I look like him a lot. So on the way back from his funeral, my reticular activator's on heart attacks. On the TV screen, on the airplane, I'm listening to music, is the Oprah Winfrey show. She's going through a new heart scan. Mm. I've unplugged my headphones, plug it into the airplane one. They're talking about this new scan at Cedar sinai that at that time was new. It could read the plaques in your arteries, the calcifications, without going, you know, really invasively. I scheduled it. I went in. I had a world-class doctor who understood reasons and leverage instead of just prescribing. Because when we coach people, you need to do this, you need to do this. Doctors do it. Take this pill, take this. He understood leverage and reasons. And I'm in the law. When I walk in, I sit down, the doctor comes up and he says, Oh my, I can't believe these arteries are in that young body. Got my attention. We walk back in, we sit down. He could still go, You need Crestor, eat clean, get out of here. Isn't that what an average doctor does, right? No, wired me with huge reasons. He goes, Let me ask you a question. Uh, I heard your wife's pregnant. Do you have, I said, Yeah, I have a son. And he says, Do you want to be there when he graduates from high school to be there for that day? I said, Yes. Sir, yeah. He goes, your wife's pregnant. What do you have? And I said, a daughter. Would you like to walk her down the aisle on her wedding day? Or are you okay that it's some other man? I went, what the fuck is on this scan, right? Like, and he goes, I want to be very clear with you. If you keep going down the road you're going, there'll be some other man with your son at graduation high school and a stranger's walking your daughter down the aisle. It's not even born yet on her wedding day. But if you do exactly what I tell you to do, you'll be there. And so to this day, brother, there are mornings when I wake up, not every morning, I don't want to go to the gym, I go, Bella's wedding, Bella's wedding, Bella's wedding. So my standards are high because of my big old reasons. Other dudes may miss the gym that day because they're not going to miss their daughter's wedding if they don't go, but I've convinced myself I'll miss my daughter's wedding. So I will get my ass out of bed at four o'clock in the morning and I will get to that gym because my reasons are bigger so my standards are higher. So that's what I think causes us to have great standards is huge reasons. 
And I think anytime you meet somebody like yourself or myself who might now appear self-confident, it's because I really had to find tools and resources because I was so insecure and shy and introverted. So I had to find techniques and resources to build that up in me. And for me, it's very simple. It's the promises that I keep to myself. If I have a habit over and over of beginning to stack one on top of the other of keeping promises I make to me, not other people. In other words, the minute you begin to get external in your life, worrying about what other people think about you, right? You've, uh, you've lost all control you, and, it, and it never fills you up. And people's admiration, people's gratitude towards you will never fill you up. It's your own, it's your own inside. And so for me, self-confidence comes from keeping the promises I make to myself. And the other part of it is being aware I'm doing it. In other words, most people don't give themselves enough credit all the time. They're very aware of these 20% things and not aware of the 80, right? And that's why the dosage is so important too. You've nailed it. It should be 80, 20, right? Because people get addicted to this. I'm not good at this. Uh, people don't like this about me. I don't feel good. Instead of focusing on the 80 and stacking it up. Wow. I did eat what I said I was going to today. I did get up when I said I was going to, I made the amount of phone calls. I treated people in such a way. I promised myself it's not just doing those things. It's rewarding it. It's being aware of it and stacking that up. And all of a sudden, because that's the messaging I was giving myself, all of a sudden, all these things start to come into my awareness that I'm grateful for. I start to magnetize to myself some people that I needed to find into my life, and that was the next layer. I started to see things to be grateful for. My health, my fitness, people who loved me. And what it did is it changed my state. When I stacked gratitude, I changed what I did in the morning, and I changed what I did in the evening. And so somehow by grabbing control of my morning, and by grabbing control of my evening, I got some measure of control over the middle of my day. I was an out of control person back in those days, meaning this, I woke up worried, stressed, fearful, and I immediately start thinking about a bill I had to pay, something that was wrong, and I'm in a state of reaction to begin every, I'm talking within six minutes of waking up. So identity is the governor on our lives. It's the invisible force that no one understands. And once they do understand and get a hold of it, their life can change. And so not only if you don't get a hold of this, will these outward conditions of your life keep being exactly the same, but it's, you could behave differently. You could do all the work out. You could be thinking great thoughts, but you are going to get out of your life. You're going to be the most powerful force in the world. I think is to be consistent with the concepts, ideas, and worth that you hold for yourself. You will get that out of your life, what you will tolerate. Okay. The deeper part of that is identity. And so identity is very much like a thermostat sitting on a wall, right? And this is important. Once that temperature is set at a certain degree, everything in the world externally can hit it and you will find a way to get that temperature. So even in this house, let's say it's set at 80 degrees. If we opened up all the doors and cold air, just the worst things in life, the blizzard of life came in, the thermostat will kick the heater on and it will regulate this room back to 80 degrees. The reverse is also true. It's a super hot day. Great things are happening in your life. It's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. If you're at 80 degrees, that internal thermostat will find a way over a window of time to cool your life right back down to 80 degrees again. So the key, the secret key is to be able to shift that identity. 90, 100, 120. Average becomes sort of like this slow asphyxiation. It's almost like an anesthetic and that over time we become kind of immune and dulled to the average that we're becoming. I know this is true, at least for me, you probably experience it yourself too. You're going to get out of your life what you'll accept. That's really difficult for people I think to understand is look, what you think you're worth and what you're going to tolerate is absolutely what you're going to bring into your life and what the outward part of your life is going to look like. And so I live by that. Like I let myself sort of feel the pain and the difficulty of, of being not where I want to be in whatever that area is, whether it's my spirituality, my relationships, my money. I let myself feel that pain. Cause as you know, there's two motivators, right? There's the gaining of pleasure, right? Wanting to go get something, chasing the dream, but then there's the avoidance of pain. And for a lot of champions, that's a pretty big driving force for them. And so at least for me, I, I leverage both of those things on me to get myself to take action. So that's what that means to me.